this dolmen is known as the Dolmen de Magez, and we're very close to the beautiful town of Rocamador. And this one is still mostly covered by its tumulus. Um, you can see people keep throwing rocks inside here because reasons. But this is a nice dolmen. Um, its capstone has broken though. Um, I don't know how long ago it broke, but it seems like it was all one piece and it somehow split. Now this dolmen is on the highest hill around. I'm just going to scan around so you can see that look at the view you have from this dolmen. It's, it's on the highest hill and that's pretty rare for these sites. Actually, most of them are just in the middle of fields, but this one is on the highest hill and you can see for miles. you're dolmen hunting when your GPS looks like this. Well, we are in the middle of nowhere in France on top of a hill at the Ma de Jantou Dolmens. And this is one of five that are in this very close area. And we found the first one. We'll see if we can find the other ones. So this dolmen doesn't have an intact capstone. I guess this is part of the capstone. Um, this is a pretty small dolmen compared to some of the other ones we've seen. Really huge orthostats on this one. They're almost bigger than the capstone. Yeah, it's like this one here seems like it would be a capstone. Again, it looks a lot more like a tomb than some of them do. Yes, this one really looks like a tomb, and it's still got a lot of its tumulus on the sides. So you can kind of see how these would really just blend into the landscape. And even though you can't tell with all of these trees, we're about on the highest hill that you could find around here. The capstone is broken. I guess this is part of the capstone, but it has these two huge orthostats on the side that seem big enough to have been capstones. And it still has its nice headstone. Um, and it's still partially buried in its tumulus. So you get a good view of, uh, I guess, it might, well, if it had its capstone, you could see how unobtrusive these things would be in the landscape. So this is right next to the first one. And I can't tell if maybe this is a second one. I don't know if maybe this is part of its capstone or maybe it's part of the capstone of the first one that we saw. So this actually might be another one.
So this is another dolmen in the complex at Ma de Jean II. They call this one Dolmen One. It's also called the Pear Cotado. And this is a really beautiful dolmen. I mean, what a specimen. It's basically complete. Um, huge capstone. But just like the one, but just like when we saw recently, the capstone has a huge crack in the middle. And it's split. It's got a big crack right here. But this is an enormous capstone. And it's really complete. I get the feeling that this one has been reassembled though. I think they uh, stood it back up because um, the headstone at the back is a bunch of stacked rocks. So I think, uh, I think they put it back together. But this is a really nice one. They were building structures like these for thousands of years. Um, in this region, uh, they date from around 5,000 years ago. The oldest megalithic structures are gonna be in Spain and in Brittany, and they're closer to 7,000 years old. Um, but they were continuing to build dolmens in those locations up until around 4,000 years ago. Well, there are allegedly three more dolmens out here, but this is what out here looks like, and I can't find them, and I'm not willing to go any further into this mess, so we'll just have to take their word for it. Jim's going in to see if he can find another one. We haven't given up yet. We found two. Okay. I think this actually might be one. Because it's sunken in over here. You've got some vertical stones. This might be one. Let's count it as one. Okay, we found we found like two and a half. And Jim found another pile of rocks across the road. Maybe that's one too. So they say that there's five dolmens up on this hill. We found two that we're certain of, and we found two possibles, and we found a lot of piles of rocks. But uh, this landscape is really gnarly, and we're not willing to explore any further, so we'll just have to take their word for it. But we did find two really nice examples up here.
just driving by and found this little bonus dolmen. It's a nice mossy capstone. See, they're, they're just everywhere out here. So where did Paleolithic people get their tools? They couldn't just roll on down to the stone depot and pick up some power tools. They had to make all the tools. Well, I'm standing in front of a Paleolithic hardware store right now. Flint nodules. All these pieces sticking out of the rock are flint. And so they could break off a piece of it and then they could shape it into a tool. Now, they used other types of stone other than flint, but since I'm standing in front of flint, that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, you can see there, there's little nodules like this. There's big ones. Um, I'm trying to look for a... They're just everywhere. Like, here's one, here's one. Here, 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 here. Tons of flint. They had no shortage of flint. I mentioned before that there are different types of tools that characterize different eras, and in the Paleolithic, they used flaked tools, where they would take a stone core and then they would chip off pieces of it in order to make their tool. And they had all kinds of tools. They had axes, they had knives, they made uh, spear points, they had tools for uh, making leather into clothing, um, they even had sewing needles. And a lot of them were hand tools, but you also have to remember that they used wood a lot too. So they would find something like this, see right here, because we're at the Stone Depot. You can get a stick like this and you can cut a notch into it and then you can tie a stone to it. And well, you have a tool that we would recognize. And because tools were so plentiful and were so easy to make, when they didn't need it anymore, they just threw it away. Because flint is so sharp, how are you gonna carry it around? It's like walking around with a pocket full of razor blades. And as they used it, um, they could chip off some more flakes to resharpen it, but uh, once it just became unusable, they would just toss it away and make a new one. I think it's neat how it just it's almost like there's a layer of stone, a layer of flint, a layer of stone, a layer of, you well, know. Well, I believe, and I'm always going to use my qualifier, not a geologist. Um, I, I think I read that these, these flint were like um, little liquid uh, ball, like little pockets of liquid. When the stone formed, it made these little like bubbles, basically of flint. So what other materials would they use for tools? Uh, they would use bone. They would use antler. Um, they would use different types of rock depending on the job. And uh, they used a lot of wood tools. Now, Neanderthals figured out a slightly different way to make tools than modern humans did. And it was called the Levelois technique. And they would take a stone core and they would chip it in certain very specific ways around the edge. And the tool would just pop out of it. And that was something that it, more modern archeologists figured out how to do it. Neanderthals also knew how to make like a glue and they would uh, like concentrate this, uh, this tree sap and heat it to high temperatures until it became almost like an epoxy. And they could use that to stick uh, stone points onto wooden spears. And that was again, something that the modern humans didn't figure out until much, much later. And so now we've just come maybe a hundred meters from where I was standing and just look at this rich vein of flint nodules. Like all of, like this is flint, this is flint, all this is flint. So 
all the Paleolithic people had to do was just knock off a piece of it and make some more tools. Inside the cave of Rufignac, which is where we are near, they there are a lot of flint nodules in the walls, and the artists sometimes used them to be like the eye of the mammoth. This is the Menhir de Belenac. Um, Menhir is another word for standing stone. Menhirs are very rare in this part of France. Um, I read that there were seven in this little area though, but this is a really big one. Um, I think that menhirs are some of the most mysterious type of megalithic structures because we really don't know what they were used for. I mean, people, people aren't buried around them. So maybe they were some kind of boundary markers or path markers. This one's very tall. How tall would you say this is, Jim? Uh, 20 feet. And it's not very wide. Or, well, it's, I guess you would say it's it's not very thick. It's broad. It has graffiti on it. Yeah, people are jerks. Um, I wonder how deep this goes into the ground. I mean, in order to support this type of weight, like, what do you think? A couple feet. Maybe. This one is really special though, to have one this size that hasn't fallen over and broken because that's very common with large menhirs. So this is a really nice example. So why do you think they put these standing stones up here? Who do you think did it? Was it Satan? Was it aliens? Was it Neolithic farmers? <laughs> I think it was Neolithic farmers. Good guess. So like I said, these sort of structures are pretty rare in this part of Europe. There's a lot more of them in Brittany and in the British Isles. Another theory about standing stones is that they represent the Neolithic axe. So it's just sort of a monument to the axe. I don't know, who can say? Maybe it's just a road marker. Maybe it's just shade for cows. But pretty sure the devil didn't put it here. <laughs> We are in Livernon, and we are at a megalithic quarry. This is where they got stones for some of the local megalithic structures. And as you can see, they had quite a buffet of stones to choose from. There are a lot of dolmens in this area, like a lot, a lot. As we're driving around, Google Maps just keep popping up more and more dolmens all around you. Um, so I think that probably explains why they had so many megalithic structures here because it was just easy pickings. So if they had access to all of this stone, why didn't they just build stone houses? Well, they didn't live in stone houses. They lived in wood houses. Um, they would also live in, a, in rock shelters and caves, but they wouldn't, um, they, they didn't build 
stone structures to live in. Um, so the houses that they lived in uh, were made of wood and they would have like um, larger logs as supports. They used a practice called coppicing where they would cut down a tree, but they wouldn't, the tree wouldn't die. They would leave the stump and then shoots would grow out of the stump and make long straight pieces of wood that can then be uh, woven and to make a nice wall and then you could cover it uh, with mud and make like a waddle and daub um, and then they would uh, cover the structure with earth and it would just get all mossy and cozy but they didn't live in stone structures that's why there's the theory that stone structures are for the dead and wooden structures are for the living This is the Dolmen de la Pierre Martin, and it's right by the Livernon Quarry. And this must be, I think this is the biggest capstone that we've seen. This is a really huge capstone, and it looks like it's broken in two right here. Um, I think you can tell, though, that not all of it is Neolithic. <laughs> they made these uh, cement ends to prop up the broken stone to help show you what it would look like. Um, these support stones are massive too. Like this is one stone and then on the other side that's all one stone that's even longer. You can see how it goes it goes the whole length. Like can you see it? <laughs> So the, and the other stone goes the entire length of the capstone. So these are really massive stones, but they didn't have to drag them very far because the quarry is, you know, a hundred yards that way. Um, this is another one of those that the local legend says that the devil put these stones up here. I don't know. It's pretty big. I might believe that one. You know, people, people in the past didn't really have any uh, comprehension of the deep past. I mean, they really only knew what they knew. So uh, it just didn't occur to people that there would be people living thousands of years before they lived who had very different lives and very different technology and would do something like this. If you'd like to know more about the Neolithic era, I have some affiliate links for some books that I really like in the description. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more history videos. And I'll see you in the next one. Have a megalithic day!